Now, Canada has long been connected to Hollywood, not just through great Canadian acting talent, but also because of innovative filmmaking. And IMAX is at the center of that story. It started when a group of Canadian filmmakers came together to produce a multi-screen film installation at Expo 67. Fast forward to today, and there are more than 1,400 IMAX theaters operating in roughly 80 countries around the world. And IMAX shares have rallied more than 20 percent this year, following strong performance led by China. Rich Gelfond is IMAX's CEO, and he joins us here in studio. Nice to see you. Great to see you again. And uh, I'm not sure everybody knows this backstory, but 1994, you, an investment banker, and your partner team up, and you buy the IMAX business. It looked a lot different than the IMAX that we know today. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Yeah, people thought we were a little bit crazy because IMAX was a niche company in uh, institutions, science museums, the film were whales, bears, and seals. And I think people, and our dream was to bring it mainstream and bring it global. Now, in retrospect, it looks like a sane dream, but one of the lessons I learned is some, um, you know, sometimes being a little over the edge and a little early is a good thing to do and don't listen to people who tell you not to. I had my uh, 25th anniversary on March 1st, as a matter of fact, since we bought the company. Wow. And uh, so, I mean, there's a lot changing. I think one of the biggest changes I've noticed recently, and chi we mentioned China, big growth factor for you. Uh, right now, everybody's talking about a film like Captain Marvel, which is now the, the biggest grossing uh, film this year. But next to that is The Wandering Earth, which is a film that I'm sure most of our viewers have never heard of, <laughs> but it is a blockbuster in China. I mean, talk to us a little bit about the changing dynamics of where the box office is globally. Well, one of the things that makes IMAX so unique is that we really are global. You mentioned um, 80 countries. We're actually in more places than Starbucks is, and 80% of the world's population is within a, a driving distance of an IMAX theater. And um, people mistakenly compare us to a North American exhibitor. We're not North American. 70% of our revenues are outside of North America. And we're not an exhibitor. We do um, different films. And specifically related to your question about Wandering Earth, um, for Chinese New Year, and it's very interesting, we play usually around three different films because it's very difficult to pick out what the real winner is going to be in China. And the first day, the film that was the winner tailed away while Wandering Earth just had incredible Traction. It's a science fiction um, 3D movie, and it became the highest grossing movie for IMAX ever in mm. China. We did $45 million on it. And it bodes well because the box office is growing in China, so the production values are going up for new content. And as that goes up, the movies are more IMAX kind of movies. So all we talk about in China is a slowdown in economic growth, a malaise, and when we're going to get a U.S.-China trade deal. Through the lens of your business, how do you see Chinese economic activity? Well, our box office year to date is up over 50 percent, um, which is, is, is incredible. Um, China hasn't had a recession or a slowdown in a very long time. But the movie industry is typically a place that does OK in slower economies because it's a, an affordable luxury. So you might go less to a restaurant or you might go less on vacation. But for a relatively inexpensive price, you can have some kind of escapism, um, family um, time. And so I, I feel good about China. There were some systemic issues in China through a couple of years ago where um, the taste shifted a little bit um, to more local content in China. And we program differently. So um, if you go back two years, about 25% of what we showed were local films. And last year, it was 33%. And I think this year, it'll be more. So I think the key to China is you have to be a little bit flexible. And you know, as you probably know, IMAX has been one of the most successful non-Chinese media companies. We have over 600 theaters open. We do over 10% of the box office for blockbuster movies. So um, it's a place we're very comfortable with. So you talk about changing tastes. On your recent conference call, very early on, you talked about the changing dynamics on, on how people are watching movies that you've got 
companies like Netflix that are now making blockbuster films, and you've got traditional film studios that are making films for streaming services. Um, a lot of people are trying to interpret where you're going with this. I've seen people trying to determine, so is, is IMAX getting ready for some kind of partnership with a Netflix? Can, can you just give us a sense on what ultimately you want to do as part of this streaming world? Sure, so from a very high level, um, more content is a great thing for IMAX because uh, the more content that's made and the more crowded it is, the more people want to stand out in that field. Whether it's a traditional studio or whether it's a streaming service, how are you going to get people to watch your programming? So for studios, there are windows in place. And the windows mean that things will play in a, studio, in a, in a theater for around three months. Um, many of the streaming services, like Amazon, respect the windows. So there's no issue if they wanted to go first to IMAX or go to an exhibitor, and then it would go online. Some of the streaming services, like Netflix, don't re respect the windows, and they want to do day and day online and in a theater. Um, for IMAX, frankly, it's not as much a, 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 a big deal as it is for the exhibitors, because you can't get IMAX in your home. Right, and for these blockbuster movies, which studios are making more and more of, and the streaming services are, people want to see them in a theater and they want to see them in IMAX because they're special. But in terms of the windowing for the exhibitors, it's really important because if it's a very short window, then people won't go see it in the theater, or the, that's the fear, they'll wait till it comes to the home in a shorter period of time. So even though we don't really have that big a personal stake, we're housed in theaters, and our partners are, are, are exhibitors, so we support our partners. I, I, the second part of the answer, really, is I think over time, the streaming services are going to start, including Netflix, to have some windows, and I think the studios will probably shorten their windows. So I think what is at this far apart now will meet somewhere in the middle. The key to whether it works is, is it sufficient for the exhibitors, and you know, we're going to stay out of that fight. We're going to let them fight it out, and either way, we'll be fine. So ultimately, I hear you saying you don't think that Netflix and, and direct to streaming services are going to kill your business. People are still going to walk out of their house and go and pay and see a movie. So I was in Pompeii um, this summer, and there are theaters that are thousands of years old. And the exhibition industry has faced all kinds of threats, right, whether it was television sets or whether it was VHS or DVD. And every one of those threats that came along, they said, oh, people aren't going to go to theaters anymore. But guess what? 2018 was a record year in North America and worldwide for box office. So there are social elements to going to theaters. Uh, for uh, kids, they want to get away from their parents. <laughs> they want to go out with their friends. No, I, I think um, the more content people may consume, especially the mid-level budget movies more online, but for the blockbusters, you know, there's just no decline. And you meant Captain Marvel. I mean, the numbers yeah. were fantastic. And you look, Avengers Endgame is coming out this year. The final Star Wars, Lion King, Toy Story, Dumbo, Aladdin, Spider-Man. It's you know, I I just don't see people sitting at home by themselves on their couch with their phone watching them, but if they're going to watch anything also, they're going to see IMAX. There still, though, is, like, we talk about disruption in retail and what you do with your retail space if you don't need as much of it because people are buying more on Amazon. And the same issue comes up in the movie business. We talk about it with the CEO of Cineplex, which is trying to do other entertainment experiences at the theater. Um, some people in the Toronto area might remember you guys had kind of a VR experience right here across the street from us in downtown Toronto. I think you've sort of learned a few lessons about VR and other entertainment experiences right now. Could you just give us a sense on what your strategy is and, and how the theater experience is changing? So we've been experimenting just like Cineplex has, and I really respect what they've done. And um, for virtual reality, we did 10 tests around the world as to whether that was an economic proposition. Pilots, and I don't think it was in the model we had, so we, we closed it down. I think the next place you'll see IMAX experiment is in the alternative content space. So whether it's things like eSports or whether it's things like music or maybe global premieres of movies where you could open. And so IMAX has 550,000 seats for any show. 
So think in the future if you could premiere a movie worldwide in those 550,000. Mm. So I think that's where we see an opportunity. Another one is in the home, we have something called IMAX Enhanced, which makes a streaming image look better. So if someone, instead of going theatrically, is streaming a property with IMAX Enhanced on your TV, it'll look better. I just want to, because there's so much hype around virtual reality, why didn't it work? Was the demand just not there? Well, I think it's early, um, first of all. I think the technology is not where it needs to be. And I think the content, the real creative filmmakers haven't figured out the killer application. So people just didn't go in enough numbers to support the cost of doing it. And again, we were at the high end. Um, you know, it may be that there's niches for other people, not at the high end. But because we're IMAX, we're at the high end. All right. Rich, thanks a lot. Congrats on the 25 years. Thank you. Quite an experience. Uh, Rich Gelfon, the CEO of IMAX, joining us.